Book 65 of 2020 was When the Adults Change, Everything Changes by Paul Dix. So this book I listened to on audio and it's about teaching and it's about how if you change yourself as a teacher, you can change your students. So it challenges a lot of current behaviourist pedagogy in terms of student behaviour management um, and suggests more of a kind of humanistic approach. So it focuses more on trying to have empathy and positive regard for individuals um, whilst maintaining kind of expected boundaries. So the current teacher training that is delivered is quite authoritarian in the sense that it might suggest strategies such as, um, I mean, I imagine that, that Dix who wrote this is maybe a little bit outdated. Um, although I'm coming from a background of, I teach in kind of like a sixth form age, so kind of, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds. So one of the examples of the things that um, Dick suggests that you get taught on teacher training is shouting, but I have never been taught to, to shout at students and I don't think I ever use shouting in my lessons ever, unless it's something that's really dangerous or, you know, something that I don't think I've ever shouted. No, I don't think I have. Um, and so it's not really something that's that's done, although some some teachers do show so perhaps um but names on board is something that i've seen teachers do um detentions is something that's common i suppose in high schools um, and isolation as well is a common you know method for behavior management in schools dick suggests that these are never effective at reducing miscreant behavior um, because what they do instead is they reinforce shame humiliation and feelings of unworthiness and so if the individual feels like that in response to how you've treated them because of the way that they've behaved, then they're just kind of going to carry on that behaviour because you've you've just made them feel bad. And so you're not really addressing kind of what the behaviour is or why it was a problem or what they should do instead. So they're not really learning from that kind of interaction with you. You're kind of just shaming them for that behaviour. And obviously that's just going to you know lead to... Um, nothing really positively changing so dick suggests that it leads to labeling of that student uh, that individual um as being kind of somebody who is a trouble student for example so i think some label them um it might lead to low expectations from that student because you know because of their behavior they're not engaged in learning so you might not expect as much from them as what you expect from other students um and ultimately due to low self-worth it might produce a self-fulfilling prophecy in that student because if they're thinking that their teacher doesn't think that they're capable of something then they might adopt that and then therefore not try and then that leads to that reinforcement of that um low expectations because they're showing that they can't actually achieve at a higher level than what's expected of them which i mean if you think about it if somebody was there teaching you and they just thought very little of you and that you couldn't really achieve much then you might just be like oh what's the point or you might kind of like achieve but just that's a bit more than what they expected of you rather than exceeding that because you know your aim might just be to you know say actually i can but you've not actually expanded past them kind of boundaries that have been set because of those low expectations um dick suggests that consistency in responses and boundaries create safety for students um because they're likely to come from backgrounds where parenting is quite unpredictable and threatening um, that's led to kind of like attachment difficulties and distrust of adults so if you've got children that are parented in such a way that um, they misbehave for attention or they they misbehave because they've not been told the right way to behave or whatever it is as a teacher it's you're kind of like the next line of defense to be the adult in that kind of relationship where you can explain to them okay these are the boundaries these are the expectations of your behavior and always respond in the same way so you know ju just because one day you might be feeling great you don't change that response like you keep the response the same so that you're always dealing in a fair way with that student um 
And then the, what happens is that student then can learn to trust you as an adult and then that helps them trust other adults and then that helps them with the attachment issues that they might have from their childhood. So you, you actually help them to develop into fully functioning adults themselves where they might not have had the opportunity to do so without your kind of input. So being a teacher is really kind of instrumental in helping people overcome difficulties that they might have from the parenting situation or whatever. Now, Dix also highlights how difficult it is for students to move between teachers throughout the day um, and to remember kind of implicit rules of behaviour which might not be consistent across the school. So this was something that I would never really thought about before, which is odd because I've obviously been at school and gone through different lessons and just never had any awareness of it. But if students are moving from your class to another class with a different teacher, or even if you're in the same subject and you move to a, you know another teacher the next year or you've got shared classes with another teacher um each teacher does things slightly differently and they have certain expectations of students behave just because it's based on on the personality of the, the teacher like for example some things that really annoy my colleagues don't really annoy me um you know if i've got students eating in class not really that bothered as long as they put the rubbish in the bin but i've got colleagues who are really against them eating in lessons um and there's a lot of school policies that say that you shouldn't be eating in lessons. I thoroughly disagree with it because um, you can't concentrate if you're hungry and you actually focus better if you have eaten something. And so, you know, I always get hungry in lessons myself. I'm always eating while I'm teaching. So um, for me, I'm kind of like, why would you not eat? But there we go. I think it's to do with, uh, you know, keeping the classroom clean and things like that. I'm not having accidents. You know, I have had students spill like a, a bottle of Coke everywhere before. So obviously that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have been that lax on that rule. Um, but yeah, it's difficult for, for students to remember what each rule is for each teacher. So they're going to slip up sometimes and they're going to not recognise that the behaviour that they're displaying is not appropriate for that class and for that teacher. I suppose it really kind of maybe emphasises the need for, for teachers to communicate and have kind of a base rule for behaviour. Any behaviour management kind of policies do need to be school wide for that reason. Um, and it's also necessary as a teacher to explicitly teach expected behaviours and not just assume that they know how to behave. Um, and also particularly if they don't come from backgrounds where they're taught how to behave. So just simple things like putting rubbish in the bin or tucking your chair in as you leave the room or not speaking when another person speaks and, and listening to what somebody else in the class has to say just because you're not being directly questioned doesn't mean that you get to have your own private conversation. So these things are, are you know, things that you have to constantly reinforce with students so that they remember how to behave. Um, one interesting consequence of COVID was that when students came back into class, they had no remembrance of how to behave properly in the classroom and you had to reinforce those explicit rules kind of constantly if you wanted to enable them to learn. So it is something that kind of needs reinforcing and, and talking about with them. And not and you know not as we just said before, assuming that they know. I think that's that's a massive thing that teachers make a mistake on is assuming that students already know things. And I often kind of think to myself, you know, why would they know? If you haven't told them, why would they know? It's kind of that that idea of thinking that people can mind read you. Um, you know, you need to be explicit in what you want, otherwise you're not going to uh, get it as a teacher. Um, now Dick suggests that if as an adult you change your behaviour, it'll be easier to change student behaviour. So he emphasises that rapport with a student and love is far more effective than punishment. And so if you have things like recognition boards for good work or you take an interest in a student's life, um, you know, you ask them how they are and what they were doing at the weekend or, you know, you um, you offer a helping hand. Um, that won't be withdrawn based on their behaviour. So mistakes that some student, that some teachers make is that you are nice to them when they're good, but then you're hostile to them when they're not good, because obviously you don't want to reinforce bad behaviour. But the problem there is that you are showing that they, that your love for them is conditional, and that's against kind of the humanistic principles that your love should be unconditional. And I imagine that this is a mistake that many parents make as well which leads to distrust of adults and distrust of other people. You have to kind of create a, an environment of safety so that the students know that 
regardless of how they behave you will be there for them you will help them but you obviously have to reinforce what's expected of them but not being hostile to them just because they haven't done what you you know you asked of them it's very difficult it's a very difficult thing to be a good teacher and to be a good parent you know it's the same kind of skill really um I suppose it's a lot easier being a teacher because you you don't have that personal kind of connection to them as you do as a parent, which makes it a bit more difficult to be a parent. Um, and also, if you if you know if you show this kind of um, love and, and positive recognition to students, it also advertises the behaviour that you want in your classroom. It's almost like showing to other students, okay, this is how I want you to behave. A really good tip for teachers is instead of um admonishing students for bad behavior praise the students that are behaving well because the other students want that recognition and so they'll vicariously learn through those students that you've rewarded that that's how you want them to behave and so they will in the future so that's a good tip for you um dix also suggests strategies such as private words rather than addressing things in class i always use this strategy because um it looks a lot worse to everybody in the class as to what's happening. So, for example, if a student's done something that's not very uh, good in the class, like they've misbehaved, whatever, and I ask to speak with them outside, I'm not going to tell them off. I'm going to have a conversation with them. I'm going to see like what's going on and why that's happening. So I'm going to be very nice about it. But everybody in the class is going to think that they're being told off. And so there's the kind of that... Um, like oh i'll not behave like that because i don't want to be sent outside to be having a talk, telling off but actually i'm not really telling them off although i suppose that criticizes the point i just made before about your classroom being safety and and not but i suppose it's reinforcing that boundary it's difficult it's very difficult this i mean i don't know if i agree with with dicks on some of these things because when i think about it, that is a very effective strategy for teach that works so you know um another thing that he recommends is immediacy of response you don't want to be watching a student's behaviour and then at the end of the class being like, oh, this is what you were doing. Um, can you not do that? You need to nip it in the bud straight away. As soon as you see something that's not OK, you need to have that conversation right there and then with that student. If it continues and persists and, you know, the, the warnings that you're giving them are not working, then that's the time to kind of take them outside and talk to them or talk to them after the lesson or whatever. But you shouldn't be leaving long gaps because, you know, if someone came to you and was like, oh, I didn't like that behaviour that you did this long ago you'd be like i have no idea what you're talking about i can't remember so a student's not gonna remember either so they're not gonna be able to correct that behavior because they can't remember what the behavior actually was or why they were doing it and they'll come up with some story in their head about the reason but they won't actually fully remember it um and it's just to kind of avoid that kind of feeling of being in trouble uh, so it won't actually be that effective so it needs to be immediate also things like thanking students for good deeds like again reinforcing that positive behavior and advertising to the rest of the class what you actually want in your classroom um, the suggestion as well is that 30 second interventions are more effective uh, than those currently adopted in schools. You can sort a lot of problems out in 30 seconds. You don't need to have a massive conversation with a student. You could just be like, you know, what's up with you? Like, what's going on? Like, you can have a joke about, I mean, humour is something that really helps with building rapport as well. I find that that's quite effective. If, for example, a student's late and I'm, and like, they turn up on time, I'm like, oh, he's on time today. You know, like, as a joke. Um, it kind of helps them to be a little bit more punctual next time. Dix is also critical of exclusions due to things like lean tables and isolation booths because what they do is they create kind of social exclusion. So you're excluding that individual from society and that exasperates issues exacerbates i don't think i said that right then Exas exacerbates issues which often lead to things like mental illness um because sometimes when students act out they're acting out because they're in a really bad place mentally um sometimes students suffer from trauma they suffer from anxiety they suffer from neglect and the way that they're behaving is often a defense strategy against the way that they've experienced life so far you know they might be being bullied or they might have issues with siblings at home or whatever it is um what they actually need you know if somebody is, is behaving in a way that's not very pleasant what they need more than anything is love and understanding from somebody um, what they don't need is to feel even worse for you know the behavior that they're that they're demonstrating it's usually a front it's usually a shield for something else you've got to kind of look underneath that really um you know if you don't show love and understanding to that student, they're just going to feel even more like they're unworthy and that's going to kind of make them worse and spiral. 
um, Dix posits that things like restorative conversations, mediation and community payback strategies are a lot more effective for students who you would normally think to exclude because they're based on inclusion. So, you know, getting students to talk to the people that they've bullied, for example, or get students to talk to the person's property that they've vandalised or whatever it is, um, and having kind of community payback strategies, they can find some belonging and some self-worth as being part of kind of programmes like that. Um, and they're less likely to continue any antisocial behaviour afterwards. So it's a kind of better strategy than trying to just exclude them and, and then them being a problem probably in the prison service later on. You know, if you if you can't deal with a student in the school, then they're going to be a problem later on for society. So it's the school's responsibility really to kind of try strategies and things that they can to try and turn that behaviour around. And the only more effective methods for that is is ones that, that promote inclusion rather than exclusion. So if you're new to teaching, I think you'll find this book really, really useful. Um, I enjoyed it. I gave it three out of five stars. I think for me, because I'm an experienced teacher, you know, I use a lot of these strategies already. And I think sometimes, you know, I'm in a bit of a disagreement with, with Dix has just came out in this kind of discussion here. Um, so there wasn't anything in there that I was like, you know, mind blown about. So, um, but then maybe that's just because I'm an experienced teacher. So if you need to teach, I think you would probably find it useful.